Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, and joining me at the at the National Convention of the Republican Party, the Democratic <laughs> Party. <laughs> I, I, I had to start it off that way, folks, because I tell you what, if you had to spend the time trying to figure out what they were doing over there, we'd really have some serious problems, okay? <laughs> but anyway, but thanks again for joining us. But no, what we're going to do today is that we're going to bring it home locally, because in all due respect, we've got some issues here locally that we need to discuss, and you, the voter, need to be uh, uh, understand what's going on. And so as far as the, as far as the, um, the, the so-called campaigns are concerned and the, the presidential election is there and the other, trust me, uh, you know, we're going to just wait around for that piece. You know, let's wait for the after the convention, and then we'll deal with that at that yeah. point in time. Maybe I'll have both the chair of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party to come and educate the voters in terms of what's going on so that uh, come, what is it, about 50 or 60 days out or something Seven, like that? 77. Yeah, something like that. See, I don't even know that anymore. <laughs> I'm going to have to wait. <laughs> Yeah. But, but anyway, so what we're going to do, we're going to focus on the Columbia River crossing. You know, this, this, this situation that has been on w with us for years and years and years. Many of you don't know anything about that piece. Every so often you might hear something or see something in the newspaper or, or hear about it, uh, maybe even on this particular show, but it's costing you money, quite a bit of money. And um, the, the people that are sitting here have, have come on the show and talked to us about uh, what the project was all about, cro just crossing the bridge. We already got a bridge there. <laughs> we already got a bridge there, but, but we're constantly spending money trying to figure out we need a new bridge. So what are we going to do? So anyway, what I'm going to do to start this thing out, I'm going to introduce these folks, introduce these folks uh, right after I get through reading this article that was in the Oregonian that was written by Jeff Mapes. It was published Monday, August the 20th uh, this year. Uh, and anyway, it, it goes this way. Obama follows in Bush's footstep on Columbia River crossing. Courtesy of the Columbia River crossing, we had another demonstration this weekend of how presidential pronouncements may not be as significant as they appear on the surface. The Oregonian reported late Friday night that President Barack Obama is expediting work on the $3.5 billion bridge and transit project along with three other projects of national and regional significance. Oregon Governor John Kitzhopper, in a joint release with Washington Governor Chris Grigori, declared that the presidential de declaration demonstrates confidence that this project will get done. Boy, that was good. That was underlined, too. Perhaps, as Portland economist Joe Cartwright was quick to point out, however, then-President George W. Bush made a similar announcement in 2008 when he gave the crossing national priority status. Remember him? Yeah. <laughs> Mary Peters, Bush's transportation secretary, said at the time, the president's order is an important step toward making this project a reality so we can get goods to market and travelers to their destinations efficiently and safely. As we now know, planning for the project continued to stretch on for years, and it's still not clear if the project will get the federal and state funding it needs to become reality. Other major hurdles include that the Coast Guard's concern that the bridge would not provide enough clearance for river traffic. Remember that statement? <laughs> Expediting doesn't mean approving, said Cartwright, adding that the delays does not have anything to do with the federal government moving slowly. <laughs> it has everything to do with the CRC screwing up. <laughs> Boy, what a statement. Jeff is doing pretty good. He's down at the Republican convention trying to figure out what that's all about right yeah. now. Cartwright, who has been working with opponents of the project, predicted that the latest destination won't prove to be any more significant than the one from the Bush administration. Anne Preston, Preston, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Spokeswoman for the project run jointly by the Oregon and Washington argued that the new blessing from the current administration is very helpful for the project. She said there is now a schedule for obtaining the necessary federal permits and said that the major construction can start in 2014. And then she ends up by saying, if the money becomes available. <laughs> Folks, there's no money. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking about to you <laughs> with activism, you know, just trying to figure out what is going on. Now, remember now, and, this, and by the way, I'm, I'm sure that this particular show might be given, if you will, to the consultant 
<laughs> so they can look into some of the points that we were making. <laughs> so we can add on to that hundred and some odd fifty million dollars we've spent in to date, right? Is that fair? <laughs> so anyway, joining me in this conversation, uh, uh, I'll call you guys activists too. Uh, just call advocate? me an expert. <laughs> an expert? Oh, I got, I'm a financial sorry. expert. I'm, got, I'm not I'm an got, ad, I'm got, not an I'm activist. The only, I'm the only activist. There you go. There but you I'm go. making uh, it available to the expert to share with us, the, the viewing audience. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so joining me to my immediate right, as, as you can see, is, is <clears throat> I'm sorry, where am I at? Where am I? I'm, Tiffany, where are you, Tiffany? I'm right here. There you go. Okay, I've got Tiffany Couch. That's right. Right? I've got Tiffany Couch, again, an expert. I mean, she's the artist. I mean, she was on the show here once before, and we really appreciate that. Boy, I tell you, I really got some excitement about that piece. <laughs> People trying to try, finally figure out what millions were all about, okay, and where they went. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So she's going to upgrade us. And then we got Sharon Nassett, you know, I mean, and then sometimes she's been, she's always been addressing the bridge to nowhere by, <laughs> by introducing the third bridge. No, I'm just saying you yeah. had the third bridge project, but my point is that you've always been talking about the bridge to nowhere, meaning no the money. Parking, well, the parking lot that we currently have. Yeah, are. but no money. I'm just yes. talking about the no money piece. That's where I, I make that point, but, you know, we've heard of that one in Alaska. Remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then we've got Herman Cachel. He's co-chair of H-I-L-P. Herman is very active in the community. He's been been involved at Hayden Island, i.e. Jansen Beach for most of it, if you don't know anything about that piece. But anything and all the activities that are around that area. So it's very important that, uh, that uh, Herman is here sitting at the table because without that particular community over there in that group, well, we really would be behind time. Yeah, we got a lot of impacts okay. in the islands. Well, I tell you, all I think different places. We're going to be talking about toll. I think toll at the, when, originally when they first started, I think it was about fifty bucks or something uh, <laughs> for for trap. Anyway, so okay, folks, why don't we start off with um, with Tiffany? Tiffany, why don't you kind of give us a little update on where we are right now? Okay. Talk to you. And I know you'd asked me to kind of give uh, some of your viewers a primer on, on what I talked about yes, before, please. and then we'll kind of go into to before. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am a CPA, Certified Public Accountant, and a Certified Fraud Examiner. And I was hired to just take a look at this project. My client um, had been asking the CRC to provide him with information or reports that, that told him how much money would be spent on this project. Right. And when he hired me, he said, Ms. Couch, can you come in? Um, the CRC office has given me 724 electronic files that each have thousands of pieces of paper in each one. And he says, I have 10,000 documents here that are purporting to support the expenditures of the project. And I said, well, didn't they just give you a simple report? And he said, well, no, they didn't. And long story short, um, he had scheduled a meeting with them. We went down to the CRC office in Vancouver, Washington, and we sat down with approximately 12 other people were there to meet just myself and my client. And they were unable at that point and told us specifically that they had no report that they could print out to show us what the expenditures were on the project. And instead, they gave me um, an electronic spreadsheet with about 10,000 lines of data and said, well, to support the 10,000 documents you have, here's all of this data, and you can figure out how much money we've spent. And these were volunteers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I undertook the project. My client asked me to, to go for it because he wanted to know how much money was spent. Right. Um, so through December of 2011, that's the most updated information I have. Mm -hmm. I went to the CRC project up, uh, website. They've not updated their they've not updated their numbers. So all I have is is the information through December. And so through December, they had spent 133 million dollars, um, basically on the environmental impact studies, rent on the project, payroll for the people that work for the CRC. Um, and of that 133 million, 93 million has gone to one vendor. Um, which is the the engineers, David Evans and Associates, who have been conducting all of these studies. They're basically the general contractor. Right. There's other contractors mm -hmm. underneath them, of course, but 93 of the 133 million has gone to one vendor. I think the other thing that's really important to understand is of the 133 million dollars, the amount the fact that they've never been on time or on schedule in terms of budget 
or or timing of their project so they'll come up with a, a piece of this 133 million and they'll say you know for 23 million we're going to publish the draft environmental impact statement and we're going to get it done by june 2008 well they never get that done on mm -hmm. time that 23 million um didn't get done until mm -hmm. december of 08 mm -hmm. not june they come back two years later and they say we're going to finish the draft not publish it but they're going to finish the draft and that's going to cost us an additional 21 million dollars right that's the which, small change which, order which with change orders turned into 33 million so there's a lot of questions here as to their ability on the study part to remain within time budgets, time constraints, and to also remain within a budget, right? Mm -hmm. um, very similar to a contractor coming into your house and saying, "I'm going to build you this. I'm going to build you a, a really nice kitchen for fifty thousand, mm -hmm. and then coming back to you and saying, "Well, I'm going to build you the same kitchen, but instead of fifty thousand, it's going to cost a hundred thousand, and the the change order isn't an extra work; it's just more money." And so there's some very big concerns as mm -hmm. to their ability to manage their costs just in the very relatively um, simple um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. environmental stage, right? Where they're just doing studies and they're not actually drilling into the ground or, or starting construction. So it's sort of like living in a, in a cost plus kind of an environment here with the contractor. Yes, but it's not called that right. in, their, in right. their world. Right. So that's what we've talked about before. We've put that out on the table for many months now. I testified in Oregon and, and Washington as to some of the concerns just with the spending thus far. In the last few months, the, the shift has really been how are we going to pay for it, right? How, we've, we've given the legislators enough information as to how they're spending the money. And by the way, they're averaging about $2 million a month. So it's probably fairly easy to, to, to assume that they are up to about $150 million through June or July of this Two year. Two million a month. That's the average. That's the average. With the work that they're doing um, out on Hayden Island, it could be more. I don't know. I don't they, know. They originally thought that it would be about $15 million to do the drilling on the island and on the Washington side to check soil samples. Okay. So... I've, I've sort of switched um, the role here um, to how are we going to pay for it. Okay. And so I've been asking the CRC to give me information so that I can understand how, how we're going to pay for it. And they, they provided me with this, this um, yeah, you if you want to hold it up. Can you, can, you, can you talk from that? I can. Tom, can you put this? You need to, but you need to point it something. That's okay. This so one. this is a document that the CRC provided me. This is basically a map of the bridge. This is the Oregon side here in the red. And this is the Washington side here in the blue. And what they're telling us is that on this red piece, Oregon is going to have to pay $595 million for their roads and interchanges. They're going to be responsible for that. And on the Washington side, we in Washington, I, I say we because I live in Washington, are going to be responsible for our roads and interchanges for $400 million. So basically each state right now has a half a billion dollar requirement just for their own roads and interchanges. Okay. The green part is the, the transit part or the, the light rail portion. They're saying that the full $850 million that it's going to cost to build the light rail portion from the metro, I'm sorry, from the... Um, what is that called? Interchange. Thank Bridget. you. No. Hey, from Hayden. Uh, yeah, basically Hayden from Hayden Meadows Island. Expo Center. The Expo yeah, Center. Expo Thank you. From the Expo Center into Vancouver will be $850 million. They're telling us that they're going to get all of that money from the federal government. What I've learned is that $850 million we have to apply for, and we don't get it all at once. So you basically can get a maximum of $100 million per year. Mm -hmm. And there's some question as whether to, or not they have to... Um, apply for that every year. Um, that's not clear at this point, but basically they're hoping that $850 million comes from the federal government, but that's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. But we still haven't built the bridge. <laughs> so the purple part here is the $1.2 billion that they are estimating it will cost to actually physically build the bridge. And they're, they're saying that that $1.2 billion will be covered with tolls and or state or local financing or federal financing. 
The $1.2 billion, we, we already know from Joe Courtright, we know from the Oregon State Treasurer and, and the experts that they hired that we're not going to get all of that from tolling. Mm -hmm. And so if we realistically give a third of, of this $1.2 billion to each state, $400 million to Washington, $400 million to Oregon, and $400 million for tolls, um, that means each state is going to have to come up with approximately $1 billion each. each. What's interesting is that at the Washington State or Oversight Committee meeting on Monday, August 20th, which was just this last Monday, okay. one of their staffers said, and I quote, each state will have to come up with $900 million in funding. So. Right now, each state is looking at about a billion dollars. We're looking at about a half a billion dollars in tolls, and that's before cost overruns. That is before um, interest on any bonds. Uh, that's before maintenance on the bridge, maintenance and operations of the new light rail portion. Do we have a final rendering right now on the bridge? They did not provide a final rendering of the bridge on during the Monday meeting because they are in. It, it appeared that they are in flux with this issue of the bridge height. The bridge height, mm -hmm. which was about. Well, coastal. their original bridge height was 95 feet from the bottom of the bridge to the water, mm -hmm. and the Coast Guard said that that's not enough a height for the users of the river, nor is it high enough for the the Coast Guard's own dredges. And so the CRC reported back to the legislators on Monday that they were looking at um, increasing the height of the bridge and, and what that would do to, to the whole, really the, the project as a whole. But they did not have a rendering that they day. They don't have a rendering. They okay. did not. And don't have a cost, cost estimate. Well, yeah. they estimated that if they were to raise the bridge to the height that the Coast Guard wanted, that that would cost $250 million. And let me be clear. They indicated that it would require a lift span, which is what we have now, and that the cost of that lift span would be an additional $250 million. That's right. Without, again, without a rendering. They did not have a, they did not now, have you a rendering. No, it's all back of the envelope. Yeah, but what I, what I mean by, in all due respect, uh, for, the, for the average layperson, I'm talking about a drawing of some sort that right. says an estimate in terms of how much it's going to cost to right. build the structure. So they don't have this, but they're still discussing about this elevation, this elevator. Because it would be, it would have an impact not only on the middle of the river, but yeah. of course, you know, the grade as it comes down into Vancouver or even back into to Hayden Island. And, and so I, I would imagine it would change a lot, but they, they did not indicate what all of those changes would look like. Okay. Why don't we just bring, bring you guys in now? Come on, Herman. Uh, I was watched the video of, of the meeting on Monday. I uh, just got through the first part of the first section of it. But they were talking about the bridge height. It's, at, you know, it's 95 feet, but it's actually 80 to 95 feet because the water mm -hmm. height changes during the seasons. Mm -hmm. And then the, the t they talked about, well, they moved that to from the 95 to 110 feet. And then, of course, when they do that, they don't know for sure yet, but they'd have to widen the supports for the bridge. Of course, that increases the cost because in water is very expensive. So that's got to be changed. Have to redesign all that. And, uh, and they still may not be enough height for the Coast Guard because they don't really know. The Coast Guard hasn't signed off on any of this on height yet because they have to apply for a permit from the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard is going to look at it and analyze it, and it will probably take almost maybe nine to ten months to do that so well the the Coast Guard actually has indicated what they have said is is they don't want a new bridge that is less than the current bridge and the current right. bridge is 179 mm -hmm. with the lift span with with the lift span, with the lift span. Yeah. Yeah. yes and and some projects actually go into the 160 range and they found out that it's not just one or two businesses, that it's a, at least a dozen businesses, and they haven't finished the survey yet, that will be affected. And it's not just a couple of, of large ships a year. It's as many as 36 to 48 a year. And that it's not that you can just cut off the tops of these these ships and things like that. They act, at, you know, and break them all down because it's actually millions of dollars to do it. Um, they said that the window of the time when the bridge would actually be at 95 was about three months out of the year. The rest of the time it could be as low as 75. And then that didn't take into account really high years. 
So meaning yeah. when you when you have more flow, right, right more runoff, right. then you're going to have a higher river. Right. So you're going to have less room between the bottom of the bridge and the top of the river, mm -hmm. and that affects that affects um, all of the you know um, commercial traffic mm -hmm. that takes their goods you know out out yeah. of the Columbia River and and onto other you, you places. You know, and when I think about when I got sort of gotten involved with ha having been lived on that, I went to several other meetings in aspect. It's been about maybe two years or so or whatever. But the issue of the Coast Guard was never an issue. I mean, when did the well, Coast Guard come up to the table? Actually, <laughs> the Coast Guard had hearings in 205. Just, 205? Yes, just specific to the Columbia River Crossing project. And at that time... Um, was the issue raised then? Yes, it was. Well, why, and actually, well, the, the task force, the citizen task force itself, uh, Robert Byrd, brought up the facts. What are these low lines for? You know, has the Coast Guard seen these? And they said, oh, we'll just get an exemption from the Coast Guard. And, and the thing is, is that since 205, the Coast Guard has said, and it's been always very clear, you can't lower bridges past a certain point. This would be the lowest all the way out to the Dowels, the lowest bridge all the way out to the Dowels from the ocean. Um, but you're not allowed to lower it because it's not like on a highway or freeway where the traffic can get off, get onto a side street, take it around, and go around. A river is a river, and so you can't have the impediments like you can on a road where you can change it. Yeah, well, and federal right. law, yeah. federal law basically states that river traffic is super. Number one. It's the number one thing, mm -hmm. right? It supersedes pedestrian, car, mm -hmm. rail. It is the number one. Um, shipway and, roadway mm -hmm. um, for goods and services for, yes and 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 there are lot everybody else is getting larger taller higher we have the ability to stay at 179 which is very high and uh, if you think about the Glenn Jackson's 144 or 140 and you think about sometimes this bridge will only be 75 That's you know fifty percent less than that one, and that one was is just barely high enough, mm -hmm. and so there is absolutely no reason for it, especially since the bridge itself structurally sufficient meets our requirements, has sixty years of life left, and so people are not talking about the value of the bridge. Besides its historical value, its infrastructure is worth between five hundred million and a billion. It can be retrofit for seismic for fifty million to one hundred and fifty million. And it can have bike and ped added to its side for about five million. You tell me the nice original decking, bridge is right the current there. one, right? And then if you upgrade the Burlington Northern Rail to a lift, more center channel, that's only about forty-two million. So you add forty-two million with the fifty million, that's about less than a hundred million dollars. Well, and you go to a full upgrade, then you have the forty-two with a hundred and fifty million. That's less than two hundred million dollars and another five to upgrade the bike path then you have a bridge for two hundred million dollars still worth half a billion to a billion dollars that can go for another sixty years and that's the that's the advocates of the third bridge that you're talking it, it, to. no that's the current that's upgrading the current bridge just, and keeping it for current. another sixty years and it's maintenance and operations is only three million dollars a year on the bridge and they're talking about they said the next maintenance they thought was a trendle in 20 uh, in 2026 well that's many years off and those parts are usually 30 20 50 million dollars or less and you so you have something that's worth almost a billion dollars and for less than uh 20 percent of its cost you can put that in and be able to keep it for another 50 to 60 years but when, when was that discussion uh, 205 was when they talked about its value. That's why, didn't we pursue $5. That? Why, why didn't we pursue that, just upgrading what we got? Well, the committee did talk about it. The mm -hmm. committee said, why didn't you look at the rail bridge, which has been recommended since 2000 or before, to upgrade it because you'll have 95% less lifts. So I'm, I, I understand that part, but what did they do? Well, what they said was is they didn't study it. So now you go back to the point of they didn't study. They also said they didn't study reusing the current bridges by adding like a larger bridge that went further out and the I-5 traffic just went off it and keeping the local bridges. So they didn't have a reuse for the current bridge, which has nothing wrong with it. They also didn't study the rail bridge downstream being upgraded. So the committee really drilled into the fact that they don't get any money till 214, so there's plenty of time to do a supplemental environmental impact statement. 
There are several alternatives that they did not study, including doing mitigation that would keep the current bridge, upgrading the current rail bridge, the seismic, and adding bike and ped to it. And they also didn't study alternative bridges next to the rail, a supplemental bridge, which were called for in the previous studies. So they have every reason to say there's a reason to have a supplement, which is very common to the current environmental impact statement. And that supplement would have to look at alternatives and look at the process itself, which the process has not been followed. They described to us that we would have a sponsor's council that's going to take citizen input. They're going to look at these alternatives. They're going to take it out there, and they're going to make the locally preferred alternative choice. When the committee itself started out, it was grand. Like when? Then in 2005. 2005. 2005. Still going to 2005. In right. 2005. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it was disbanded in early 2007. And so you have a year and a half where they weren't there to make those decisions, and they're supposed to get our input, which is why when the locally preferred alternative was adopted, it has 138 caveats. We don't, and, that, and as it came out in the review panel, 138 caveat knots is not adopting a locally preferred alternative. It's merely kicking the can down the road, so you still have to have a sign-off on every one of those 138 caveats and any resolution since 2008 that have come up okay. before you can go forward with the record of decision. Nobody is talking about the, that list. So the Washington Oversight Committee did a very good job in drawing out some things. Um, I, now, now, are we talking now, that when you say Oversight Committee, are you talking about these folks? These are the folks that were listening, if you will? And so yes. so Washington State, during their uh, legislative session this year, put together a, a, an oversight committee over the CRC project, and basically that's made up of several um, legislators, um, both senators and representatives. They do have a public, a member of the public, and they also have the Washington State Department of Transportation Secretary. Yeah, uh, her name committee. is Paula Hammond. And they are on the committee, and their job is to basically oversee this project, ask questions, et cetera. Hmm. And what about Oregon? The Oregon, side, Oregon has a, a similar, a similar committee. Kind of, now, they, they, I take it they jointly get together to talk. They to have not things. yet. They are going to. However, uh, CRC has been setting the schedule, and so they're talking about not having a joint until in session until uh, January, and that's quite a ways out. What what we would advocate is that. We've been having these oversight committees since 210, and everybody keeps finding a list of c concerns and problems. So we need to say, oh, here's obvious, didn't follow the process. Here's obvious, they answered us back. They didn't look at alternatives. We need to look at what would a supplement environmental impact look like. Right now, this committee can look at different things, and they need to look at that so they can have information for the legislators to say, well, we can still meet all the federal timelines okay. for financing, okay, so, and this uh, is what would look different uh, uh, instead of continuing to go into the same I hear you, but you said we. Now, who are you talking about we? Who are you talking the, about? The members of the Washington Oversight Committee, and actually the Oregon one can, too. They found enough concerns that they need. So they the know Oversight they, Committee, uh, you said, are responsible. Uh, they yes. are able to look in and make recommendations. To the to CRC? The, no, to the, no, to the legislators. The Oregon the and the Washington. The already on it. Well, not committee. the whole. Yeah, you know, just. It, it, what, what they are is oversight. They go and they look in it. They smell it. They turn it over. They ask a few questions, and then they come back to the legislators, and they say, you know what? We found problems with it, or we didn't. And in, and what but we're saying the is. That's makeup, isn't it? Isn't it in, in part of the makeup of the oversight committee and legislators? It, that's what they are. It, it is a legislative. They go back to the legislature. A Washington right? and Oregon legislative oversight committees is a committee of a legislators, representatives, and senators right, yeah. that look at what's going right, on, okay. and then they can make a recommendation right, back. Right. But what I'm saying is, is now that they already know it stinks to high heaven and they got major problems, there is no reason for them not to say, well, since we have to bring back information, part of that information is how would it look like and how would we go forward with the supplement? And we should be in interested in investigating with those people of can we go forward, would we still meet the timelines and everything, and we should be asking those questions of them different than the same people that got us into this problem. 
Okay. And okay. instead of continuing to look at the quagmire of all the problems, because since 210 we've had oversight committees saying there's major problems. So now if we have them say, you know, there are problems and we're going to have to get into that, but how do we go forward right now so that we don't miss the funding deadlines because well, well, it is imperative we have a project. But there's no funding. There is by 214. <laughs> no, there's no funding. <laughs> Yeah. I'm still there. Cur currently, there right is now, no funding. There's right no now, no money. There, the, the, yeah. none, none, 14, I plan right, on cutting right. a purple ribbon. Right. None of none of the, ex you're correct. Correct. No is, Absolutely. They actually there, did get some money. They got three. They got three, three million. million. Yes. <laughs> For and they're some, spending two for million. More on. design and, and, and fumbling, I guess. That's right, but but that's very true. There is no <laughs> funding at this point. Nothing's guaranteed, <laughs> and in fact, there were two gentlemen from the federal government, one from the Federal Transit Authority and mm -hmm. one from the Federal Highways, who both said, "Well, you're in line for this money, but if you don't keep going, right? If you don't push it through, that money will go to other projects in the other parts of the United States. And so it was very clear that this funding is not, and even if they were to get in line, they would still have to apply and still um, have to win the awards for uh, the money. Well, uh, and I'll tell you, wait, just hold, hold mm -hmm. on for a minute. I think we're going to take a short break so I can catch, a, catch my breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really in bad shape, and I'm sure some of the viewing eyes are trying to figure out what's going on. All but those numbers were Oh, around. very much just, so. Whoa. The numbers are not there. These are just numbers, no dollars. <laughs> but the numbers, That's right. right. Okay, fine. What we'll do, we'll take a short break. Again, we'll come right back to crossing the Columbia Bridge. The bridge to nowhere right now. No money. We'll be right back. <laughs> You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks. I guess here again, and we're, we're talking about crossing the Columbia River. And uh, if you've been with us in the, the first half hour, uh, I don't know if you're confused or not confused, but, uh, but let's put it this way. Um, there's no plan for a bridge. I mean, we're talking about a bridge, but there's really no bridge, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm getting out of it. Yep. And I, I've sort of rested a bit to kind of get a sense of what, what I've been hearing. <laughs> that's what I'm hearing. I mean, that's from a layman's standpoint, okay? Yeah. And um, so now we're going to try to figure out that we'll try maybe to get into various parts of this thing that might uh, might be of some concern to you, one of which might be the, the tolling process, because if, in fact, you're going to be going to Washington, uh, I might make a point that um, especially those folks who are, they just passed this, this this liquor deal. Remember this liquor deal? I do. The liquor deal. <laughs> the idea was to basically keep the revenue in Washington. That's right. And then it was passed, and all of a sudden it wasn't to sell. And now all of a sudden they're all coming to Oregon yeah. to get the crossing the bridge. They're crossing the river to, to, to get cross the liquor. To get the liquor. Help, so help now, Oregon out. That's right. Increased revenue. So now if you put sales. so now if you put a toll on that, I think that's the whole idea. You put a toll to keep the residents on the other side of the bridge. Yeah. 
So they sell bar liquor in Washington. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just thought I'd throw that in there for That's a minute. Good. So there are some concerns, okay? So look. So it's all to promote liquor, liquor sales in Washington? Yeah, Is with that the, what toll, you're the toll. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, toll. Let's, let's, let's talk about toll for a moment. You sure. Know? Go on, Tiffany. Let's, let's talk do a little it. bit about toll. Okay. So what does that mean? part of the CRC plan has always been to add a tolling component to pay for part of the bridge, all right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of their final impact statement. And, and just for your viewers to understand, I know we've been talking about an impact statement or an environmental impact statement. The federal government requires uh, a project like this to go through a whole series of studies on in the environment, finances, the effect on the economy, people, okay. um, in order to you know get the permitting to mm -hmm. make a, a project like this go forward right. and that's in very simple layman's terms right. as simple as I can get part of that was a financial analysis and the CRC um, they printed or they published their final impact statement in October of 2011 so just less than a year ago okay mm -hmm. and their own schedule talks about tolling rates all right and what's interesting to me is that the tolling rate schedule that's printed in October of 2011, mm -hmm. their tolling rate schedule are in terms of $2,006. So it says so, toll rates are shown in $2,006. Toll rates are assumed to escalate 2.5% per year. So if you look at their tolling rate schedule and it says during peak hours, it's going to be $3 per one way or six dollars round trip mm -hmm. that's how much it would have cost in 2006 okay so what we did is we just basically said all right if we add two and a half percent a year which is what the crc says we need to do how much is that toll going to cost when they open the bridge and they're estimating they will open the bridge in 2019 that three dollars actually turns into fourteen dollars and four dollars and fourteen cents or eight dollars and twenty-eight cents per round trip. Per round trip. Right. So, and and I say that because they say toll rates in each direction. So there's some assumptions here that the CRC is going to toll in each direction. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Eight dollars a day for a typical commuter times twenty days a month, approximately, to go back and forth to work. That's approximately one hundred and sixty-five dollars per month out of a typical commuter's wallet wow. before they come to Portland and have to park, wow. before they come to Portland and have to pay 9% of their uh, income tax, you know, to this to the state of Oregon. Um, and if they're a Southwest Washington resident, it's before an increase in sales tax to pay Gee. for the operation and maintenance. So that's a pretty significant that's dollar now, amount for a typical, typical family. Mm -hmm. Eight dollars wow. a day, and that's again only that's minimum. Um, that's before you know if there's cost overruns here, if part of the billion dollars on each side has to be uh, supported by tolling revenue, it could be much more than eight dollars. And of course, that's for your typical vehicle. That doesn't include a truck. Right. You know, any vehicle with more axles. You know, freight traffic. They're going to pay much, much more. Wow. wow. And and also that is if you do a pay as you go which means you have a transponder in your car that you put money on and every time you go past the bridge it can take the the, the money out of your account that's the electronic way that's the electronic As way opposed to now a lot of people it. don't want a, a transponder in their car because that means that wherever you travel to and anytime you are going by cell towers it can track where you're going so then if you decide that you want to go through not a, a not go through that but you want to go through a system that does plate recognition plate, plate recognition costs a dollar and then it's two dollars more to have that done to your car and the banking and everything because it's a different way of drawing it out of your account so then uh, or to, to add it to account excuse me what so that's a two, two dollars well I mean basically you have like, a little little thing yeah yes. a little card that's hooked yeah. to your Thank you you have a trans or... yeah you have a transporter that's in transponder that's in your car or you have like a, a card which is magnetic and you can put them up in your car and they'll take it in and out but if you go that way then there's a three dollar each way fee so now instead of paying four dollars you're paying seven dollars each direction wait a minute this means I'm, I'm hearing uh, something now suppose I don't have a bank account what happens then 
You're you, not get, you get, to drive, you, you, I'm get sorry. you get, you get, you get this. You're not supposed to drive. I'm sorry. You, you, <laughs> well, you, I mean, it you depends. You the person who would get this card, and you go and you put money on this card, and it say it's card 200 and whatever, so that doesn't identify who you are. And you have that money on the card, and you have it up in the window, and the window, and as you go by, it can deduct or not deduct from the card, and that's. Part of the fee, as opposed to having really a well, transponder well, and, and in the and let's car. Not, I, I don't think we Please, should get no, that no, detail. No, no, okay. Okay. So yeah, I think yeah, what's yeah. important to, and I can't all. speak to any of that because I don't know, I don't know about how the process is going right, to work. Right. But if you don't have a bank account, right. there, there's two different ways, right? And mm -hmm. um, for example. Um, there might be a way for them to okay. capture your vehicle and they know who the vehicle's registered to, so they send a bill to the to the registered owner. Or there will be physical people, um, just like at the Tacoma Narrows yeah, Bridge up in Tacoma, money, money. where there's people there and you exit off, right. you pay your money to, to a physical person mm -hmm. and they take your money and you've paid your toll mm -hmm. and off you go. So it just depends on um, how they decide to, co to mm -hmm. collect the tolls, but certainly there will likely be a piece where it's just automatic and they just, you, you have that card or a transponder in your mm -hmm. car and it's just an automatic thing, mm -hmm. but certainly for you know non-local traffic, there's, there will be a way to capture mm -hmm. um, tolls, okay. either physically or by sending a bill to the registered owner. That's Herman, generally how it works. Herman, what about the, the island? Have you, have you, has that discussion Well, there's been, been on, discussion. I know the mayor of Vancouver wanted to toll the whole corridor, you know. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, obviously don't want that because we're in Oregon yeah, right, on the island. Right. Why should we be paying for the bridge when... We because for me, I, the toll goes on. I'm not going across that bridge. I'll go around another way and go back 205 bridge because they won't toll <laughs> right, that right, one. Right. Although Washington Legislature has passed the, an agreement to toll 205. No, it's opposite. No, that's right. It's opposite. Actually, that's opposite. so they yeah. can know. What's that's interesting right. is they can't. The the legislature passed that that right. bill, right? So there's not right. going to be. You can't toll something that. Um, has already paid for basically yeah. and is right? and is not and doesn't receiving require any upgrades. Any, doesn't require any upgrading or you know maintenance. I, I should but say. the mm -hmm. the regional transportation commission is now looking at Council. 205 mm -hmm. and looking at mm. high capacity transit over there and they're starting their own studies so it's sort of up in the air as to whether or not eventually that will be told to but it can't be told for this project, project. it would have to be told for its own project right. what yeah, about that's the federal the federal level I know I've read that that they don't they discourage that sort of thing you know? mm -hmm. but, but, but that could change you never know right, but right, but right. what's important to understand in terms of collecting money right because right. the the goal of the toll is to collect money to pay for the project and to pay for the upkeep of the project mm -hmm. if you have people that say well gosh I'm just going to go drive over to 205 or I'm going to find a job in Oregon and live there or in Washington and live there, then their ability to collect enough revenue to pay for the debt will become much more difficult. And we've seen that in Tacoma. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge had difficulty in collecting enough revenue to pay for the debt. Hmm. And so one of the biggest questions I have is, what happens, right? What happens if we have cost overruns? What happens if the tolling revenue isn't what they they say it's going to be? Who does that fall to? Mm -hmm. Who's responsible? Mm -hmm. That's Those are questions those are that have not questions. been answered right. yet wow. that I think are important. Right. We just need to understand, right? right? right. Just tell right. us right. what's it going to be. Right. Um, in, but, in but Oregon's case with the Oregon Department of Transportation, they do not have a good history of keeping on budget. I mean, they have projects that go three <laughs> times over budget, yeah. two times over budget, and and length of time can double and triple as well. well so. And uh, the the toll at the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and I keep bringing up Tacoma Narrows because right. it's one of the most recent. Where is that located? Um, uh, right in Tacoma, Tacoma Washington. In Tacoma. Right, okay. it's on. It it basically takes people out to the peninsula part of okay. of Washington. They just increased their tolls by forty percent last year. We went up 40 percent so not two and a half percent right, right, right i mean 40 right, right, percent right, right. basically they needed to collect more they weren't getting as many cars over the bridge so they needed to collect more from each car mm -hmm. so that they could eventually make well you know you payments. make a good point because in in, it, in our city here in oregon people are riding being, being told you need to ride bicycles now what about bicycles will they be will they be paying tolls <laughs> I, that's a good question i don't know <laughs> 
What about people just walking across walking the bridge? Runners, what about people or... walking across the bridge? There's another thing in Washington, too. They've got another, there's two bridges that are fairly close together. I guess they go across Lake Washington, I think. Yes, the 520 bridge and, one's and the I 90 bridge. And, and one's the, not toll. Right, the mm -hmm. 520, they're yeah. looking to replace. Yeah. And so, in, in anticipation of the project, they've started tolling it. Right, but I-90, which is the, the major, you know, interstate highway, mm -hmm. that's not told. Yeah. And they They've had major diversion. 25%. Major change. diversion. Yeah. diversion. So when, when somebody, road. when a driver has a choice, well, I might have to go out of my way a few miles. Right. In our case, I-5 and I-205 is about six miles. Mm -hmm. If I have to go out of my way to avoid the toll, the diversion can be upward of 20 to 30 time. And I've seen yeah. estimates as high as 40%, right. depending on how far apart you have uh, that option. And they certainly are seeing that on the 520 bridge, not only in terms of the number of cars coming across there is, is much lower than what they had anticipated, but the diversion is, mm -hmm. is also pretty But, but again, so, let's get back to that point about bicyclists. Are they going to tow the bicycles? I don't know. I know. Well, what light about the rail. people just walking? Gonna, what about light rail? Yeah, you, told you people pay, light pay toll? No. Well, light rail, the <laughs> light rail folks, the well, the light rail folks will have to certainly, I, that's a really good question. I mean, certainly if you're riding the light rail, you're going to have to pay um, a fee to to ride the light rail. I, I don't know what that fee is going hmm. to be. Well, gee, let's see if it's minimal. That means that if a person can say, okay, fine, what I'll do, I'll just park my car. One, I'll, I'll, it'll be a two-family car. I'll park one on the other side <laughs> there you go. keep one on this side. And what's really interesting is that CTRAN, who is the – CTRAN is the organization that runs the right. buses currently exactly. in southwest mm -hmm. Washington, mm -hmm. in Vancouver, okay? CTRAN has put together several different projections, realistic, optimistic, and pessimistic, yeah. saying – Here's how much it's going to we're, revenue we're going to make, mm. and here's how much it's going to cost us to run the light rail. And then their own scenarios, they are they are um, basically spending more money than they're bringing in, and within five to ten years of the project opening. And so, in every year, they start burning cash, meaning they have to spend out of savings just to maintain their current level of service. So what we're seeing already is CTRAN's own projections are showing us they're not going to have enough money to run this. Year. They're not going to make enough from riders, right, in order to, to, to spend or to, to maintain the light rail piece. And that's really important to Southwest Washington voters right now because they're going to vote on Proposition 1 in November as to whether or not they're going to give CTRAN an increase in sales tax revenue. And the, the increase is to pay for the light rail. But what's interesting is even with that sales tax increase, if the voters say, yes, CTRAN, you can get this money, we'll mm -hmm. give you more sales tax revenue, mm -hmm. even with that increased sales tax revenue, CTRAN will not have enough money to pay for the light rail. Mm -hmm. So then my question becomes, for that piece, who pays for it? What happens to the regular bus service? CTRAN, if you can't if you can't pay for what it's gonna cost to run the light rail, then what are the what are the consequences? Exactly. Is somebody else, is the city of Vancouver gonna have to pay for it? Are you gonna have to ask for more sales tax? Are the riders gonna have to pay more? Saying, yeah. Are you gonna have to get rid of regular bus service? And we don't know. No, we don't know. I was just wondering how when you know the people on light rail with at the Oregon Washington border there for the you know, how are they going to divide up the revenues? Right, exactly. Because somebody paid revenue here, yeah. or, or, toll, or the uh, fee to get on the, in Oregon, and then or got in Washington, and then they're going to have to split that somewhere, I, th I would think. It's my understanding that there's some sort of operating agreement, or sort of like a contract, where it's just... Yeah, figure out some equitable... <clears throat> and, and right now, CTRAN is estimating that it's going to cost $4.2 million a year in expenditures to, to run just that, that two-mile piece. 4.2 million. So, folks, you know, th this is really something. I mean, you know, here we are discussing something. I'm, I'm, you can imagine what happens in these meetings. Yeah. I mean, I look at Sharon over here, boys. I mean, she's been over there day in and day I out, sideways. Right she's, she's there day in and day out. That's the reality I mean, of it. I, I mean, when she comes, I imagine something In fact, better. when she comes to my place, I mean, she, she just goes into the coffee, just kills herself. <laughs> <laughs> Poor lady's trying to stay awake. She's there 24 7. <laughs> Doing an excellent yes. job, you know. I mean, but no, this is a very interesting subject matter, and the public, and that's why we're doing this now, by the way, because, in all due respect, you're, you're not familiar. Imagine, imagine, here we are trying to get answers, and you're not there. You're just paying the bill. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. You got me? And we are in a recession. That's true. And look like we're going to be getting into another recession because yeah. whoever wins the presidency, we're going to be right back where we started. Well, and that's what's really important, right? Because if the federal government is hurting, right. then their their ability to send more money to the states right. is less. Right. And so the state then has less money to split up around projects for the entire state. Right. So if you put a billion dollars of your transportation money into one project, then you're taking that billion dollars out of all other areas of the state mm-hmm. because all of it's gone to one project. Mm-hmm. And so that really would affect projects statewide. And that's why legislators statewide in each state um, needs to be aware of what's happening. And just realistically, when you start thinking about federal dollars that are going to be going in this deal, uh, we are in a partisan politics kind of a era, if you will. Mm-hmm. So uh, this has not been uh, uh, Governor Romney's kind of territory. Mm-hmm. You know, both Washington and Oregon is pretty well identified with the Obama situation. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, if, if, uh, if the Governor Romney becomes president, guess what? There ain't no money. <laughs> and then on the other side of the coin, there ain't no money, <laughs> there ain't no money in the anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and the people who are giving the money up to the campaign are saying, wait a minute. The only change you we have is that coin in the air. Yes. I mean, that's the bottom line. It depends on who comes up with the votes. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into the politics. Yeah. That's another era that we're going to talk about. But no, it is a concern. You know, it's an issue here. You know, I mean, politics plays heavy in this kind of business. And then uh, the other thing I was going to ask you about is that uh, when, when you talked about all the paperwork that the federal government is pretty well requiring, if you will, to go through this whole process, and we, CRC pretty well had that charge, right? Oh, yes. Did they follow the process? Have they followed the process? There's some they- question. Their documentation on what they say they're going to do right. does not match their testimony on Monday. And nor does it match the document. We've been asking for minutes and things of, of, of what they, they said that they were going to do and what their early documentation says. It doesn't match what they're now telling the legislators. So there's a very big question as to whether or not. And certainly there's a, there's a whole entire lawsuit by a group in Oregon that says, hey, CRC, we're, we're suing you because you didn't follow this environmental process. And here are all the processes you didn't follow. So there's certainly already lawsuits out there um, uh-huh. from other groups who are claiming that the CRC didn't follow uh, the process. Certainly in coming up with the locally preferred alternative, there's some discrepancies there. Wow. Um, time will tell. Well, then, when you think about it, the immediate supervisors are the respective governors, one from that's Oregon true. and one from Washington. So that's who they should be suing. I mean, I, I don't get caught up in the deal. One of those lawsuits is Hill, yeah. Hey Down Livability Is that right? Project. Oh, talk we about that. Environmental, well, did you? Know, it's based on environmental uh, justice issues with okay. the ma- manufactured home community. And they were, uh, what CRC has managed to do in this process is they looked at individual neighborhoods in Washington to mm-hmm. look at impacts. But on, on the island, they just looked at the whole island. They didn't break out because we got high income mainly on the mm. east side of the island, east side of I-5. We got lower income in the like 440 spaces, almost 13 or 1400 residents in the manufactured home community, and a lot of those are, are elderly. I'm, well, I consider mm-hmm. myself mm-hmm. I'm retired, mm-hmm. yeah. working part time, mm-hmm. and they just ignored all that. That we've got this big body of people because we're about 2,000, 2,200 right. on the island mm-hmm. in total. It's almost half or more than half our lower income and you know have your elderly limited mobility health issues which and is they all just part chose of the process, to ignore yeah. it you know wow. and look at it just as one big island <laughs> so that's what we're basically suing about is they didn't they didn't follow, follow the procedures yeah, and, and look at the community in a more because there are specific environmental um processes that right. are required right. so they did yeah. benefit and impacts all the way through construction financially environment neighborhood historic land use, buildings historic all of it um major questions as in not being followed including on the island itself looking at alternatives further down next to the rail where zero businesses as opposed to 39 uh 27 floating homes right there under the bridge the other one no homes mm-hmm. so you have no construction on i-5 no interruption of i-5 uh, putting something in new no interruption of businesses and no loss of homes mm-hmm. and it wasn't looked at or studied 
when you ha and you're supposed to be looking for least amount of impacts yeah. and benefits and or the cost of doing all of these the renewable added, homes. The added thing in this right now, there's uh, the uh, city is going through this process of looking at annexation of West Hayden Island, and the the idea is that 300 acres could be used for an industrial area, mm -hmm. and you got 500 acres that are left natural, and of course that's going to the one thing they want to try and get at is using Hayden Island Drive, which is the main road across the island or lengthwise of the island for a, a truck route which will probably cost 20 to 30 million to retrofit to be able to handle trucks but then you got the issue of well how is CRC landing on the island and how this is all going to fit together with this incre increased truck traffic we'd have although they try to downplay say well it's mainly rail traffic and ship traffic and this you know so it's not going to be and they and the thing I'm after, and I, I keep every chance I get, I keep spreading the message about we've got to keep that bridge from West Hayden Island to Marine Drive right. as an option to right. cut down that impact of having any kind of truck traffic on Hayden Island Drive. Mm -hmm. You know, that's got to be an option. It can't be just because they want to just throw it off the table right. and right. just look at Hayden Island Drive as, and and we don't know if the CRC is going to go through. There's no money now. How's that going to tie in with this increased traffic from West Hayden Island? Of course, that's off at about 2025 to 2035 is the idea for jobs there. But, you know, it's just there's too, so many things happening right you now. You brought a good point about the West Hayden Island thing because I noticed in the, Steve Dean did, did an article today in the Sunday Argonian, yeah. mm, and I they did. got some extra I money did. at the port. Oh, uh, they got, I missed they, that. They got big money, and basically, well, we're they, saying that yeah, the port was subsidizing some of the vendors that were coming yeah. in, yeah. and uh, and I mean, two maybe mm -hmm. thirty, forty million bucks or so. Yeah, you because, know, because because of the congestion, the, the <laughs> union thing, uh, about two jobs, <laughs> and they money? diverted containers were diverted out of Terminal Six to other, so they mm -hmm. re, uh, port reimbursed them. The thing they didn't bring up is when they diverted those containers to those other ports, they got. Well, they got compensated. They got money from yeah, that because they, they diverted it. Yeah, right, right. They got but paid have, twice. have you guys got any money? No. <laughs> Folks, We're look. non-profit. We, well, sure. we have to have to come on. We could probably go two or three more hours. Well, we probably we? could. We really yeah. could, you know. But I guess my point, I guess the point, the last thing I would say is that, hey, the buck stops with the governors, the respective governors for each state. It's not just CRC. And the, and the and legislators. And the legislators, the, the, but still, the, the, but still, the legislators are the, the ones that are going to be active. Yeah, but the still, the, 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 the no. buck, but I'm just still saying the bucks just stop where someone. Well, the bucks need to stop, period. Yes. Bucks the yeah. need to stop, the, period. The legislature but, are all a part, part of the, the, the committees and this, that, and the other. What the heck. So anyway, look, I want to thank you very much. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Tiffany. Thank you. Sharon. Herman. Thanks, sir. Always a pleasure. Okay, good. Just keep up the good work. And to you, the viewing audience, the paying audience, you know what I'm saying? The paying audience. <laughs> Remember those tolls, okay? All those folks that are coming over picking up the booze, guess what? You may be looking at about another, maybe, maybe about another five or six bucks a bottle, okay? Take care. Have a good one. As George Page always said, back to what you believe in. Talk to you next week. <laughs>